Okay, welcome back everybody. This time chapter 11. It seems like we're getting towards the end. To be honest, we're really getting towards the most exciting, and that's project control. That's really what this whole conversation has been about as a project manager. We're focusing specifically on scope, cost, and schedule, which are the triple constraints that we have been addressing all along. Your primary measure of success, though there are others, as we discussed, including strategy uh, and lessons learned, etc., customer value, okay, along the way. So uh, looking at scope, right, scope is about the objectives, and as we study the objectives, we collect requirements, usually through a business analyst. And so it makes sense in requirements, we're looking to address or control technical issues, quality problems. I'll give you an example of technical issues. I was once installing uh, Isilon Hadoop as a data lake, and I was told that normal disk drives would work. About halfway through the project, we had a major issue, and it turned out that the engineers and architects said, well, you need uh, solid-state drives, SSD drives, which cost an uh, so much more than a regular disk drive, right? And that's what I mean about as uh, um, uh, management reserves, I had already set aside some money to accommodate things like that, right? So these things will come up. Uh, and so sometimes a client wants to change things also, right? Remember at the end of each phase, you have a, a, a phase gate. That's a go, no-go decision. And you're going to show the product to the customer. And they're going to go, well, I know that's what I said, but it's not, now that I see it, it's not quite what I want, right? Steve Jobs would say, the customer doesn't know what they want, right? That's controversial by itself. We could talk all day on that, but it's just interesting to think about. Um, back to my other issue with ISON Hadoop and the needing to change drives in the uh, uh, data storage system. There are interfunctional complications that just will happen, right? That's why when I deploy something in the IT environment, like antivirus, I don't just roll it out to everything. I do the endpoints first because it's fairly controlled environment, uh, the, the desktops, I mean. Then I might approach the virtual machines. Then, and I'm learning lessons as I go so that when I get to servers and break that down into critical servers, I uh, have a good idea of the direction I need to go and the risks involved. Same with cost, right? Uh, every time I do this, I'm updating costs. One of the things I like best in a control perspective, a monitor and control perspective, is doing bottom-up estimating early on. With bottom-up estimating, it gives me accurate costs for the items remaining, and super accurate costs for the items closed because eh, they're closed. Love bottom-up estimating. Uh, keep in mind you want to control scope creep. Remember the triple constraint. If I change one of the triangle, the others will change too. If, if scope increases, it will lengthen my schedule. It will lengthen, it'll increase my cost, right? Maybe I bid too low. Back to the conversation we had in resource management where you want to make sure your bid is accurate to include your profit margin. Uh, and, and of course, reporting is a key part of the control piece. What data do you draw? How often do you draw it? And what format do you collect it in and then present it in an executive summary uh, to decision makers? And of course, we have to do it in a timely way ahead of the change. We want to be proactive as project managers. And then, of course, schedule. The <clears throat> schedule is probably the hardest thing to control. Even though scope creep is the reason most projects fail, scope creep, scope cost, scope gap, those three issues, uh, the schedule is probably what eats up most of our time, right? And uh, perhaps the sequencing wasn't uh, proper. So remember the network diagram with the dependency arrows? Uh, and it, we had predecessors and successors, maybe we didn't get that right, right? Maybe the resources we planned on were not available. So what were we doing as a project manager to continue to communicate with functional managers 
their commitment to us uh, and to remind them. It shouldn't be just a month and a half later, hey, today I need your resources, right? We want to manage that. And remember I said 90% of what the project manager does is communicate, and those are good examples of that. Of course, you'd want to run change orders, uh, especially if you're working in a contract form or a major company. Um, you know, the schedule can be impacted by a lot of things. We call them EEFs, like if the government passes a new regulation. It's something outside of our control, but yet impacts our project. We have to be able to address that. So the fundamental purpose of control is to manage the results, to understand them, and to be proactive to get ahead of them so that we can keep the project going, right? There, you might consider physical access control as one way to do that, right? I want to do, I, if I have a widget maker, I want to stop the midget, widget maker periodically to retool it, to oil it, to grease it, to uh, make sure it has precision tuning and then put it back into operation. As I mentioned in earlier lessons, I can't run an airplane 24-7, 365. I've got to schedule downtime to take care of it. And then, of course, what about my inventory coming? If I have a widget maker, do I have widget maker parts waiting for the next step? Well, uh, we mentioned human resources control. I hate to say control when it comes to human resources. In fact, the PMI Institute now says monitoring uh, human resources because we don't really control people. We, we manage them, right? We coach them, we guide them, we steer them, we lead them, that sort of thing. And so, we, but we want to make sure our, um, our system, our, our activity owners are managing their budget, are staying on track, are staying ahead. So I would look in the work breakdown structure, which I said has a work breakdown structure dictionary that goes with it. And I'd look in the dictionary and I'd have conversations weekly with uh, uh, activity owners to make sure that they are keeping up with their milestones, their budget, uh, and their quality control. So three types of control processes, uh, cybernetic control, go-no-go -go control, and post control, which is not my favorite. So a cybernetic control is a system that is constantly monitored. Uh, and, and so you'll have a dashboard and maybe a a SOC center, right, that is getting information in IT, right? We're getting constant feeds from an intrusion detection system, and we're monitoring that all the time, and we have it set for certain alerts, right? If power goes too low or the memory usage goes too high, right, we get alerted in advance. And um, it's kind of a negative feedback loop. Now, here's what that process may look like. I have inputs to the process, and um, that's going to lead to outputs that I'm going to get in some sort of dashboard, and I'm going to go ahead and compares it to the standard, like memory usage, and I'm going to go ahead and make a decision, or my team will. In fact, I'll probably have it tiered. They can make certain decisions, others they need to escalate in terms of control. I shouldn't have to do everything, really, you know. Um, and so information requirements for this sort of cybernetic controller is um, you, you have to have a counter action for every action so you'll run checklists a lot and compare it to standards this may not be possible uh, for complex systems but uh, i have found that it gets more possible every day especially in it i know um, i have a friend making a kidney machine that will wear around it will measure when you're on medicine uh, if the kidney's about to fail right very complex systems and yet uh, we're able now to uh, create counter actions for that so as time goes by and technology continues to uh, improve in an expedited fashion this will become less and less important um, but you still need to have a counter action for every action okay you also can do the uh, go, uh, no-go decisions. We talked about that at the end of each uh, phase. Uh, you have a go, no-go decision. And in that, you want to test first. You want to do your quality control testing within your project. 
to make sure it meets your specifications, your scope, your quality standards, then you want to go show it to the customer and make sure they agree. If not, they will recommend changes along the way. Okay. And so uh, a lot of project management is centered around go, no go. Make sure you're doing your quality control testing internally, and then you take it to the customer. That process, after you do quality control, that process with the customer is called validate scope, right? You're validating that what you're building is exactly what they wanted, even though you have it in writing what they wanted, right? People change their mind. Remember, what we're doing is unique. Um, go no controls. So we want to make sure we have the data collection. Remember, data is just raw, right, from our widget maker, or whatever we're doing. And we want to compare that data versus the plan, right, uh, or that, yeah, that the data is actual and the plan is what we wanted. So we have this plan and we're going to compare it to the data. And if they're not the same, if they're the same, good. We don't need to input any controls we don't need to take any more action today but if there's a mismatch between the plan and the actual results then we need to as project managers leap into action hopefully in a proactive way not in a reactive way so we have these phase gates where we pause before we go on to the next phase of our project and we look at the controls in place we look at the data we collect it and make it turn the data into information because we've analyzed it and with that information then we produce executive summary reports uh, pass it out to the key leaders at the right meetings and make a decision is this product meet the requirements of this phase and ready to go on to the next phase it's why you have a process that we'll get into in the final uh in week nine which is close project or phase. This is the phase part of it. Okay. Uh, now, post control. These are not my favorite because it says the project manager wasn't proactive. Sometimes it's life. You have to do it. But we want to be proactive. We want leading indicators demonstrating that something isn't right, uh, like in a control chart, right? I might have a rule of seven where the data points quit their natural deviation, natural variation is a better way to put it. And so I want to uh, make sure that I am uh, managing that along the way, and I want to make sure that I am able to apply uh, rigorous uh, capability to it. So, um, okay, so in a post-control, right, uh, sections, right, we might have a the project objectives in a simple report, then the milestone gates and budget that went along with that. I want to have the results and always make a recommendation. I like to give two or three recommendations. One is usually a throwaway, but make a recommendation uh, on fixing it. Now, so we want to have this design control system, right? We want to understand how the project will be controlled. And so I want to have a board. I create a change control system or my design control system, right? And this board through me is the project manager. I'm wholly responsible, as you recall. I will set the standards, uh, make them clear, uh, address who has voting rights on the panel for the changes, um, what we expect to achieve, what we're monitoring, I'm listing in all of the management plans. Remember, every management plan is how I'm going to do something focused mostly on control. And these are some of the things that I want to um, manage in that control effort, right? Is my effort or my deliverable useful? Is it cost effective, simple, accurate, timely, flexible? Is it documented along the way? Okay, I'm going to stop there and come back. We'll finish up chapter 11 together right after this break.